16. If you're here for the first time, we are in a series uh, through the Gospel of Luke, and we've come uh, to chapter 6 this morning. You know, I'm so grateful that the Holy Spirit not only inspired his word that we're reading uh, this morning, this is the word of God, amen, but also the Holy Spirit is active even now, not just when the word of God is written, but the Holy Spirit is active even now to, to give us understanding of his word, to enable us to hear God's voice, uh, to know, uh, to know that God speaks to me this morning, and that is my prayer, that you would hear uh, from God this morning, and uh, God's word, and, and God's promise, and God will give you the faith to respond. The title of the message this morning is Chosen and Called. Chosen and Called. And let's begin to read God's word, beginning in verse 12. And these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when, and when they came, and when they came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Aphius, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This morning, and give dependence upon God. Oh, Father, we thank you that you've given us your precious word. We thank you that you not only created us, but you created us for a purpose. You want us to know you. We were made to know you. We were made to worship you, to know your love, and to be able to, be able to love the way that Jesus loves us. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear this morning, that you would help us to be attentive uh, to your word. God, I pray that we would hear your call this morning. That we would hear you calling us in very specific ways and that we will surrender to that call uh, for your glory and for your honor, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let me ask you this morning, are you living with a sense of calling? You know, occasionally, I get asked the question, uh, how can I discern uh, my calling from God? How can I discern my calling in life? Why do people ask this question? There are many today Christians and non-Christians who are searching for meaning in life and believe that it's connected to discerning and living out your calling. Moreover, there's plenty of biblical work to this idea that God has placed us all on this earth with a purpose and with unique, and with unique gifts to fulfill that purpose. While writing about his saving encounter with Jesus, for example, the apostle Paul records these words uh, from Jesus. We're going to have them on the screen in Acts chapter 26, verse 16. Again, uh, Paul the apostle had this encounter with Jesus, and Jesus speaks to him, and, and, and this is what he says to, Peter, uh, to, to Paul, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. When you study the life of Paul, you'll find he lived with a great sense of calling. He knew what God had placed him on this earth for and he went after it with holy resolve and with an understanding that he was living for something greater than himself, something worth dying for. Again, let me ask you, are you living, brothers and sisters, are you living with a sense of calling? You might be thinking, if I had the kind of encounter that Paul had, that Paul had with Jesus, it would be more clear to me and I would be more confident about knowing and living out my calling. You know, Paul's encounter with Jesus certainly impacted his life in a tremendous way. But if you're familiar with his life, you would know that it was the presence and power of the Holy Spirit within and the providential circumstances without that led him into his specific calling. And I want to tell you this morning that if you're saved, 
the same spirit that lived in Paul lives in you to enable you to discern your calling and to, and to live it out to the glory of Christ. Amen. Uh, in light of this, how can we best define what a calling is? How can we best define what a calling is? According to 1 Corinthians the chapter 12, our unique calling is connected with our unique gifts. And those unique gifts are given with a specific purpose, namely to help make the lives of others better. With this in mind, a Christian vocational psychologist defines calling, we'll put this on the screen, defines calling as a transcendent summons towards purposeful work carried out for the greater good. In other words, a calling is connected with a purpose that seeks to make the lives of others better in the present and more imp importantly, for all eternity. So living with a sense of calling, brothers and sisters, is not only for Christians in full-time or part-time vocational ministry because it's connected with your gifts. It may involve changing vocations. But more than that, it involves, well, listen, it involves having the right perspective in whatever vocation or work you are doing. So if you can connect, oh, brothers and sisters, if you can connect your work to a purpose that helps make the lives of other people better, you can find a sense of calling in your life. And here's the main idea. Christians are called to prioritize cultivating intimacy with Christ through which they are enabled to discern and live out their calling. And so this morning we're going to learn some lessons from Jesus and his appointment of the 12 apostles about discerning and living out the call of God upon our lives. To start with, we see from our text that the 12 were chosen and called through the consecration, the faithful consecration of Christ. While the earthly ministry of Jesus was in full swing, Luke records again, beginning in verse 12, and these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night, he continued in prayer to God. That's what consecration looks like. And when they came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12. Let me ask you this one. Do you pray? Do you earnestly pray before making major decisions in your life? As, especially as it relates uh, to your vocation. Repeatedly throughout Luke's gospel, he points out that despite many things vying for his attention, Jesus made time for prayer. As his fame was spreading, for example, which meant that he was in great demand. We read in Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 15. We'll have this on the screen. Listen to this powerful uh, testimony about Jesus. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but he would draw to desolate places and pray. What does the faithful prayer life of Jesus demonstrate to us, and what should be our response? You know, I used to, I used to think that Jesus didn't really need to pray, but that he did so to be an example to us. Yes, Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. And during his earthly ministry, oh listen, he surrendered the exercise of his divine attributes like his omniscience to the discretion of his heavenly Father. Moreover, Jesus cherished, oh listen, he cherished fellowship with his Father, through which in his humanity he received strength and guidance and discernment. Again, we see a great example of this in our text. 
before uh, choosing the 12 apostles who would play a major role in the establishment of the early church and in the spread of Christianity, Jesus didn't just pray. He spent, the Bible says, all night in prayer. The prayer life of Jesus, well, listen, the prayer life of Jesus wasn't just a formality. It was a significant part of his consecration to God. Concerning his consecration to the Father, we read in John's Gospel that when his disciples were urging him to eat something, he responded in John chapter uh, 4, beginning in verse 32, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Oh, can I tell you? True satisfaction and contentment in life comes from living out your calling before God. Somebody say amen. Again, in the humanity, in his humanity, Jesus was subject to the will of of his father, which included the exercise of his divine attributes. As such, explains one commentator, listen to this, he did not possess, he did not possess all knowledge, and his unaided knowledge was not sufficient to know whom to choose. Moreover, Jesus had numerous disciples, so it's conceivable that during those night hours, He presented them individually to his father so the nod would be given to those who were to become the 12. Prayer was everything to Jesus. Through the pendant prayer, Jesus lived a life of flawless perfection so that according to John's gospel, he could say, oh, listen to this, I do nothing of my own authority. But speak just as the Father taught me, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Amen. Beloved, the twelve were chosen and called through the consecration of Jesus, which was demonstrated through his devotion to prayer. And if devotion, oh listen, if devotion to prayer was necessary for Jesus to accomplish the work he was sent by the Father to do, is it any less necessary for you and for me? And we'll put this on the screen. If you would discern, oh church, if you would discern and live out your calling for God, you must be consecrated to God, which necessitates devotion earnest devotion to prayer. And all God's people said, moving on, to our, to, moving on to our next point, we see that in addition to the apostles being chosen and called through the faithful consecration of Christ, they were also chosen and called to first commune with Christ, to be with Jesus. After spending all night in prayer, through which he discerned the heart of the Father. We read in verse 13, and when they came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. It's important to note here that Jesus chose the 12 from among other disciples who were following him at the time. How many disciples he had, we don't know for sure. In Luke 10, we know that he he has sent out 70 disciples ahead of him to Jerusalem. Whatever the number, he chose, oh listen, he chose 12 who were already following him and appointed them to the office of apostle. Again, these apostles, minus Judas, with with special authority, would play a key role in laying the foundation of the church with Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. An important lesson, oh church, an important lesson to learn here 
and we'll put this on the screen, is that discerning your calling is not a one-time event, but rather an ongoing process. As we take steps of faith and obedience to God's word, we will discern and live out our calling. Amen? But as Christian vocational psychologist Brian Dirk shared regarding his journey to discerning his calling, oh, listen, we can be so worried about making the wrong choice that we don't take steps and consequently we miss our life's calling. But what we fail to understand is that not only is our sovereign God able to redirect us, there are likely many pathways we could follow and still be faithful to our calling. Like Joseph, who went, uh, who went down some challenging paths before he moved into his calling, which included spending time in prison on false Charges sometimes, well, listen, church, sometimes the paths we willingly or unwillingly take are preparing us for something greater. Amen? But it's important to emphasize here that unless we maintain close communion with the Lord, we will not only miss opportunities that would lead us into our calling, but we will lack the faith and the character necessary, necessary to step into it. In fact, as the parallel account in Mark, Mark's gospel indicates, oh, listen, the 12 apostles' first calling wasn't to ministry, but to intimacy with Jesus. In Mark chapter 3, and I love this passage, we read in Mark chapter 3, I believe we have this on the screen, beginning verse uh, 13. Listen to this. Parallel account. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12 whom he all named apostles so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Notice that in verse 14 of Mark's gospel, he notes that Jesus appointed the 12 so that they might be with him and then so that they might go out and make disciples and, and have authority over the forces of darkness. As I heard one faithful uh, pastor uh, testify, and we'll have this on the screen, I used to think, that I was called to ministry, but then I discovered that I was first called to intimacy. Ministry is the outflow of intimacy. Amen. As I said in the beginning of the message, many today, many today, including non-Christians, want to discover and live out their calling in life. Finding your calling has become a popular in our culture today. But there's a difference. There's a major difference between a humanistic view of calling and a Christ-centered view of calling. Often the motivation of some for discovering their calling is a personal drive towards self-fulfillment. The calling of God, on the other hand, is again, and we'll put this on the screen, a transcendent summons or its purposeful work carried out for the greater good. That is to say, a true calling is connected with a transcendent purpose that seeks to make the lives of others better in the present, and again, more importantly, for all eternity. This Christ-like calling which leads to a truly meaningful life is not motivated, oh listen, it's not motivated by personal gain, but by the love of Christ, who though he was rich became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. But to have, oh church, to have this kind of self-giving motivation, we must come to know the heart of Christ by cultivating intimacy with him. 
In light of this, it's important to point out that when Jesus spent time with his father all night in prayer, he wasn't just giving God a list of requests related to making his life easier. He loved to simply be in God's presence and commune with his father. Additionally, his prayer life didn't consist of telling God what his plans were. He wanted to know God's plans and God's heart, which, were or, which was oriented to contributing to the well-being of others and helping to bring them into their calling. What's more, on that mountain, alone with God, he wasn't just talking to God. He was listening for God's voice and submitting to his plan And perhaps the reason he waited before the Lord all night in prayer was because his aim, his aim wasn't for God to hear him, but rather his aim was to hear from his heavenly father. I wonder if our prayer life bears any resemblance to the prayer life of Jesus. Do we seek the hand of God to move in our lives for our personal gain? Only for our personal gain? Or do we spend significant time seeking God's face? What does it mean to seek God's face? We'll put this on the screen. It means cultivating intimacy with God that leads to the accomplishment of his purposes, which are carried out for the good of others. Now, in addition to first communion, communing with Christ, the apostles were chosen and called to fulfill the commission of Christ. Again, in verse 13, God's word says, and when they came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. After praying all night, And discerning the heart of his father, Jesus chose from among his disciples 12 whom he named apostles. The name apostle means, as we've heard many times from this pulpit, it means sent ones. Sent ones. As I noted earlier, the 12, as eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, were sent by the Lord with with, with special power and authority to lay a new covenant foundation for the early church. Through mountaintop experiences and many trials, they would in time grow in faith and in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to lead a new Christian community to spread the hope of Christ throughout the world. And our presence here today is evidence that they were successful. Who were these men? Who were these men? Luke listed their names beginning in verse 14. Simon, whom he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Aphius, and Simon, who was called Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, And Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. You know, almost uh, most of the apostles' names, notably uh, familiar to us today, at the time that Jesus called them, they had no notoriety whatsoever, other than the fact that one was a despised tax collector for for, for Rome and and another one was a Jewish, Jewish zealot, which required that they learn to get along. They were all very ordinary men. As one commentator observed, all except Judas Iscariot were Galileans, country boys. Four were fishermen. One was a hated tax collector. Not one of them was famous or rich or noble or well-connected. Not one of them was a scribe or a priest or an elder or a ruler of the people. They were, as their detractors labeled them, uneducated Common men, Acts 4, verse 13. Yet they formed the nucleus of a band that conquered the ancient world 
with grace. And I put this last sentence on the screen. One of the supreme glories of God's call is that our weakness is the opportunity for his power. Our ordinariness makes room for his extraordinariness. Amen? You know, we see this principle gloriously displayed all throughout the scriptures in the lives of men and women like Moses and Ruth and Jeremiah, and Esther, and, and, and the 12 apostles. Moreover, this paradoxical principle of the upside-down kingdom that God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary is clearly spelled out by the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will, I will boast all more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, I am content with weakness. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. Beloved, to live out our calling, we must embrace this paradox that those who God mighty uses live with the reality that weakness is an occasion for God to show his might. Moreover, in view of Christ's self-sacrificing love, we must die to self so that the, so that the resurrection power of Christ rests upon us. Now, it's important to clarify that to discern God's calling and live it out with Christ's resurrection power doesn't, or listen, doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go into full-time vocational ministry. If you've received Jesus by faith as Savior and Lord, according to God's word, you are a representative of the kingdom of God, and as such, you have been called, no matter where you are, to be a minister of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 18, the apostle Paul powerfully declares, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ this morning? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So living... Living with a sense of calling is not only for Christians in full-time vocation of ministry. Because your calling is connected with your gifts, it may involve changing vocations or starting a new ministry or joining a ministry. But more than that, it can involve changing your perspective in whatever work you are doing. If you can connect uh, your vocation to a purpose that helps make the lives of other people better, you can find a sense of calling in your life. Christian author Al Rolters puts it this way, and I believe we also have this on the screen. If Christ is the reconciler of all things, and if we have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation on his behalf, then we have a redemptive task wherever our vocation places us in his world. Amen. You know, to illustrate this point, there's a classic fable about a man who approaches, who approaches three other men in a rock quarry. Each was asked what he was doing. The first man said, I'm breaking these little, these big rocks and making them into little rocks. The second man said, I'm making a living to provide for my family. The third man said, I'm building a cathedral. I'm building a cathedral. What cathedral? 
are you building? Again, living with a sense of calling may not necessitate a change in vocations, although that may be in the cards. It's about connecting what you're doing with a transcendent purpose that has the capability to not only make the lives of, of others better, but to also transform your attitude and the quality of your work. As he was shaking hands with church attendees after the service, recounts uh, a senior pastor. He asks an unfamiliar attendee to get acquainted question. What do you do? He expected to hear an occupation for an answer. Instead, he listened, he listened to Heather's insightful reply, which we have on the screen. Oh, pastor, she said, I'm a representative of Jesus, cleverly disguised as a machine operator. I recently heard another similar testimony about a hospital janitor named Maggie Garza, told by vocational psychologist Brian Dirk. He shared, oh listen, he shared that she has a job description that involves sweeping floors, wiping down surfaces, taking out the garbage, etc. She does all those things and she does them really well. But she sees her job as bigger than that. She builds relationships with people. She prays for them as she goes from room to room. She orients her activities so that they minimally dis are minimally disruptive to the flow of doctors and nurses. She sees what she's doing as a calling because she links it to this broader mission that the hospital has of providing high quality health care. And that's precisely what she's doing. Amen. But up, beloved, whether you are a stay at home mom, a janitor, or a pastor, living with a sense of calling is about knowing why you are where you are, why you're doing what you're doing, and who you are doing it for. Amen. If you can link what you do with a transcendent purpose from God that contributes to making the lives of people better and fulfill that purpose and love from the outflow of your intimacy with Christ, you will make a difference in this world. You will live a meaningful life for the kingdom of God. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads this morning. Praise God. Heavenly Father, help us. Right now, dear God, we heard your word. We heard your word, Lord. And we want to be more than doers of the word or hearers of the word. We want to be doers of, of the word. Can I get an amen this morning? We want to be doers of the word, God. And I trust that your people heard from you this morning. Not because I'm a powerful order, because I'm not, I'm weak in so many ways. But I know, Father, that your strength is made perfect in weakness. And I trust in your word. I trust in your spirit. I trust that we heard from you this morning, God. And so help us. Lord, help us to respond. Help us to heed your voice. Oh, how precious it is to hear the voice of God. Can I get a witness this morning? Lord, help us to hear your voice. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to ask you this morning, are you living with a sense 
of calling. Are you living with a sense of calling? Do you know God has called me? And we should know that. We should know that. All of us should know that in a general way. Well, I, I believe God wants us to know it in very specific ways. He wants us to live with a sense of calling. Again, that's connected with a transcendent purpose that helps make the lives of other people around us eternally better. Amen? And so, this has been my, on my heart all morning. I was asking the Lord, what, how do we pray? How do we respond? And I believe that God confirmed this. I believe some of us need to pray this. Lord, show me. Show me the plans and desires that I need to surrender to you. And show me the ones that I need to pursue. Would you pray that prayer to God? Show me the plans and the desires that you want me to surrender to you and the plans and desires that you want me to fulfill, that you want me to go after. Would you consecrate your heart to the Lord right now? Would you consecrate your heart to the Lord? Would you surrender your heart to the Lord? Would you tell him this morning, I want your plans. I want to fulfill your plans. Amen. And how many of you know everything you need to fulfill it, when it's God's plan, he's going to give it to you. Amen. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But he's going to be there with you every step of the way. And perhaps uh, this morning, you've heard the call of God in a very specific way, but you haven't heeded it. Maybe you've already heard God telling you to surrender something that you were going after that might not be what God desires for you. And he has something else better. Maybe you already heard that, and today you just need to trust God, amen, and, and surrender it to God. And, and again, ask the Lord to show you the plans that he wants you to pursue, the calling that he wants you to pursue. And maybe you're in a vocation right now. I was talking to someone about this recently. And they confess to me that they have lost sight of their calling, of the purpose for why they are where they are. And, and that led to all kinds of issues. But wherever you are, whatever vocation you're in, how many of you know you're there to represent Jesus? Don't you want to represent Jesus well? And maybe you would say today that I've lost sight of that. I've lost sight that I'm a representative of Christ. Where I, where I am. And I haven't been making him look too good. And I, I want you to forgive me, Lord. Would you, would you tell that to God? I haven't had the right attitude. How many of you would confess I don't always have the right attitude in the vocation and in the place that God has placed me? I don't always have the right attitude. Amen? Confess that to the Lord and, and ask him to give you a fresh understanding of your calling and your purpose, a new resolve, a new strength in light of all that Christ has done for us. In view of his sacrificial love, would you ask the Lord to to give you a fresh perspective of his purpose uh, in your life, a fresh, a fresh sense of his calling and the grace to live it out. 
Uh, maybe you're here uh, this morning and you've never surrendered to the call to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The greatest call that you could ever surrender to. He loves you. He died for you. He paid the price for your sin. He rose again so that you could be free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin, and come into a relationship with him in this life and for our eternity, a relationship where his spirit comes to live within you, to help you to know your calling and to live it out. So if that's you, if you've never surrendered to that call, would you trust Jesus today? Is there anybody here? You're trusting Christ for the very first time as your Lord and Savior. Anybody here? If that's you, would you come at the end of the service? Prayer councils are going to be standing up here. Maybe you're watching online. Give us a call. Let us know. I trusted Jesus Christ. Fill out the connection card online. We want to know that you've trusted Christ so that we could pray for you and follow up with you. If you're here, come forward. Make it public that you've trusted Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, help us. Uh, God, thank you that you have given us the privilege to represent your kingdom. Uh, Father, we, we, you've entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation. So God, help us to be faithful to that call where we are. For your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.